Hey guys, how are you doing? Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to having a nice conversation about uh, what's going on in Improvada and what's going on in the industry. Anthony, good morning. Delighted to be here. Very good. Let's start off. Um, if you want to tell me a little bit about, I mean, most of the people that are going to listen to this have certainly know Improvada, tons of customers, but uh, for the few that don't know too much about Improvada, tell me a little bit about the organization and your role. And, and when I say your role, you know, we know what a CEO is, but I would imagine, uh, you know, you'd get 10 definitions from 10 CEOs. So your thoughts about you know, what the role means to you. Wow, what terrific. Uh, Improvada is a digital identity company that has over the past 18, nearly 20 years, uh, uh, been focused on digital identity, serving the healthcare community, the healthcare, really mostly the provider, the healthcare worker, the provider marketplace. It's based in Lexington, Massachusetts, uh, and it's an incredibly innovative company. And uh, it, it uses technology that is uh, that improves the productivity uh, and uh, you know safety and efficiency of our healthcare workers. Uh, so we look at healthcare workers as one of our audiences, uh, and everything we do, we look to observe, understand, and respect the workflow and uh, and not disrupt it, but really help accelerate it. Um, uh, and on the other hand, we ensure that our technology uh, for the IT part of the audience uh, of our customers, um, that it supports their cybersecurity initiatives, uh, that it delivers uh, cybersecurity controls and safety in keeping our hospitals uh, safe from hacks uh, and attacks, and also compliance. So this is really what we focus on. Digital identity, we take it and we apply it for our healthcare, our clinical uh, healthcare workers, um, make them efficient and productive with IT. And for the IT side that has to run these systems, we wanna make sure it's effective and provide cybersecurity controls and compliance controls. And we have a number of solutions around this uh, that were well known in the industry. And frankly, we lead uh, the industry in. Uh, and we continue to innovate in those areas. Um, so, in fact, one of the things that we've uh, been uh, released recently is a very simple, very transparent uh, two-factor authentication. And you know how two-factor authentication is used by many, many people to elevate your level of security. Uh, but it's a little bit of a pain, right? You've got to whip up your phone. You've got to look mm -hmm. at this text message or an email that's got a token. You've got to read the token and transpose it into your other screen. And you know all that is you know not particularly difficult, but it consumes time. Right, it disrupts your flow, it disrupts your mental acuity, it disrupts the you know for for providers, for doctors and nurses, you know who are trying to do their work. It it pulls them away from focusing on the patient, which is really what they're there to do. So we said, all right, let's solve this problem. And uh, you know we used uh, com computing technology uh, and things like Bluetooth to make that. Um, uh, that injection of the token invisible. So, you know, you've got a two-factor token that's coming to your cell phone. We automatically know you have a cell phone. We can talk to it via Bluetooth. Uh, we find a token and we inject it without the doctor uh, having to, you know, pull the phone out, look at it, read it, type it. All of that has now gone away. So, you know, doctors see this, they love it and say, hey, why don't you guys do this earlier? And we say, well, you're right. We should have done it earlier, but we've done it. And, uh, this is some of the work that we do. We make things very uh, simple and efficient, uh, respecting workflows uh, and secure and compliant on the other hand. And as, as CEO, uh, mm. how, do you, how do you think of the job? How do you think of what you're supposed to be doing? Yeah, I, uh, boy, it's an exciting job. It's, uh, you know, it's got, uh, well, CEO, you're really responsible of every part of the business and every part of the family uh, and all of its employees of delivering value to our customers, uh, all the way from ensuring customers are getting value, um, that we're servicing them well, that we're responding to, uh, you know, their inquiries and their issues. So there's a lot of customer interaction. And that's a part that I especially am fond of, that I, I really love, because that, that is ultimately who gives you the real answers of, of what they need and and, uh, and how well you're doing servicing their needs. Um, and then, uh, you know, from customers, we go into what are our products? How well are they working? What can we do to make them better and more efficient? 
Um, and, uh, uh, and also, as a CEO, you have to understand how you are presenting those solutions to your customers. What is your marketing organization doing? What is your sales teams uh, doing to support that, uh, you know, that relationship? Uh, and, uh, and of course, you've got a whole back end of the business, you know, the back office, and it's there to support everything else. So you, you kind of have your hands in everything. Right. And, uh, I, you know, in my case, I, uh, I really thoroughly enjoy that, but I focus a lot on customers and a lot of my, uh, on our customer engaging employees uh, and the solution space. Um, uh, but it does vary by company. Uh, you know, it varies by company, company and by person, right? I mean, as the CEO, you define the job. You say, you personally say, I want to work with customers very much. I like that. I suppose you could have CEOs that are more inclined to look at financials and numbers and live in spreadsheets. I don't know if that's the way to be, but you probably have all different varieties and flavors. You particularly enjoy interacting with customers. That helps you understand the market and set the direction of the company. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And that's why I prefer these enterprise focused organizations where the enterprise customer is very much, not just a customer, a partner. If you do it right, you're really solving problems today and working with them to solve problems in the future as they see them uh, and as they see those problems, um, you know, as, as they prefer to see those problems solved. Uh, you know, but there are other markets and other CEOs who, you know, for example, if I think of, uh, I don't know, um, you know, social media companies, right? You know, do they interact with customers at the same level? No, they interact at a much higher volume level, which frankly isn't, you know, isn't that appealing, you know, personally to me, but, it, you know, that doesn't mean that uh, that's being done the wrong way in those organizations. So, so yeah, my preference is to touch the customer directly. Uh, they've got my cell phone number um, and they can call it, and they do uh, call it any time of the day. I've heard other, uh, organizations and people talk about that desire to become a partner uh, to their customers. And it's, uh, I've heard it almost expressed that we won't sell you a one-off piece of software. That's not the relationship we're looking for. We want to come in and help you uh, improve your overall organization and better understand. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? Is that how you try and approach it? Yeah, I, I think companies have to uh, earn the right um, to build a relationship. Um, and a relationship can at times start with a niche solution, a little tiny gizmo, uh, a gadget that solves a very, very specific problem. Uh, and that's fine. And that, 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 that is one type of relationship, um, you know, but it is a, a, a tactical solution. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Improvada really was very much in this mode three or four years ago. Uh, but we saw the opportunity to be an even stronger partner to our customers. And in many respects, customers asked us to do that and asked us to be that. So we asked the question, how do we become strategic, you know, to our customers? How do we really become an, a, a high value partner to our customers? So, um, and that's really how we build this, uh, you know, our direction, our messaging of digital identity vendor for healthcare. Uh, whereas in the past, four years ago, you would have heard of Improvada as the SSO company, the single sign-on company that makes, you know, uses your badge, the one that's got your picture on it, the one that used to enter the building, uses that to just simply access your computer. Uh, well, we went from that, you know, very narrow solution to let's use that badge or maybe your fingerprint to access anything in healthcare, to access your shared workstation, to access your private workstation to access a shared mobile device or a tablet, to access a medical device. Um, so, you know, really wherever there is an authentication, a digital identity authentication event, you can now use Improvada. And, and we're the only company that invested to do this. Um, we of course work within the hospital, but also with cloud solutions, with cloud applications which hospitals, uh, especially now with COVID, are more and more open to adopting. Um, so, you know, the Simpravada, you know, solution now works across so many more devices, so many more locations, uh, so many more uh, users that we really become strategic to our customers. And that's just a testament to, uh, you know, the, the, the level of innovation that, uh, that, 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 that this industry generates. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, 
customer relationships during COVID. Um, so one of the things I found very interesting as this whole thing evolved and took place was I started to see from CIOs and other IT executives postings on social media that indicated a, what I call a hypersensitivity to being approached and sold to. Uh -huh. And, and they, you know, it really got very interesting to me. And I wondered, uh, you know, what were, what could CEOs do? You still have to do business, right? Yeah. And, and customers need you. So you have your existing customers with a relationship. You have customers you'd like to sell to. You might say to yourself, I think our products can help these other organizations. So we want to approach them. I don't know if you, if, if you noticed that sort of sensitivity or thought about it or gave any instructions to, to your team about how we delicately navigate these waters. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's a, it's a terrific point, terrific question. I, uh, you know, frankly, we've seen episodes such as, such as this, maybe not as, a, as acute or as intense as COVID, but, but in, in, a, in our you know, last recession, 2008, 2009, uh, or even in year 2000, when we were dealing with more of a, you know, a simple flip of a date, uh, right? You know, our customers were very hyper-focused even in those instances, on a very specific problem or set of problems. Right. And, if, and, and, and I had very quickly observed back then, um, and, we, and these are lessons learned in 2000 right. for me, you know, if you try to you know, tell them about what's good for you as a vendor, yeah. um, that's not going to fly. You really have to uh, do things that are good for the customer. Now, that's no great revelation. That is what vendors should be doing around the clock, not just at a time of a you know, pandemic or, or a recession. So, but some people understand this better than others. And my job as a CEO is to guide our organization to do the right things at the right time. Mm -hmm. And those are different. Uh, let me give you an example. Our technical support teams have to be so as we hit COVID, you know, in early March, you know, late February, early March, we realized that we got to close the office, get our people out of the, right. you know, out of a high density infectious, potentially infectious environment, send them home and make sure that they're operating. So we could be in a position to help our customers. Right. So, so that's what we did very quickly. We turned our attention for, for a few days away from customers. Uh, we didn't ignore customers, but we said, look, it's, you, you got to leave the office now because that means you could get sick uh, and your family could get sick. And if you're sick, we can't help our customers. So right. let's take care of you, send you home, get you settled, get you operational, because then we got to very quickly turn our attention to our customers who are putting their lives on the line. They're putting everything they've got on, on this. And we were able to do this very quickly. And that meant that our technical support people, people that would keep our networks operational, allow our customers to expand into the temporary facilities and, and the 10 hospitals that were being set up, that we were ready to help them. So there, customers absolutely appreciated our help. And you just can't miss a beat there in right. helping customers build and maintain these networks. On the other hand, when you talk about selling, that's a no-no. Pull back right give customers the time to get their situation under control to execute their plan because their priority is to keep patients healthy to treat them well keep them alive right and that's really what they're there for so we really encourage and we pulled our sales teams away from checking and overwhelming and uh you know asking for the po that's the wrong right. thing to do so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very good point. Asking for right. PO. Right. So, yeah. So you, you've got the two sides of the business. On the one hand, that says, hey, we still got to ship the product. It's got to be quality. It's got to work. It can't cause issues. And if there are some questions, we've got to be able to help customers very quickly. On the other hand, when it comes to selling, uh, that's something that you have to understand is not, is going to be very different, is not going to happen. Uh, but there is also a middle part where customers look, can you send me more remote access licenses? Can you give me more one sign licenses? I can't give you a PO right now because my uh, back office is completely offline. And we said, whatever you need, here's a key, more licenses, use it for the next number of months. Uh, once things settled in three or four months, we'll come back and figure out what's the right thing to do. So that's the other middle ground that we established very quickly. We got our employees safe and operational very quickly. 
uh, we made sure that we could support customers technically. This is tech support, this is implementations. And we made sure that customers, if they needed more licenses, they could get them very quickly without having to send us a PO, without having to you know, pay us money because we knew that they were overwhelmed and that's not what they could do at that time. And we just weren't, you know, other vendors did, did things differently. You know, they expected a PO and we felt that that was just wrong. Um, so that, that's, what, that's the way we've handled this particular one. And for the most part, in fact, all of our customers have been very grateful uh, for giving them that room to handle this emergency. Um, again, they're at the epicenter of this, this attack. We did one more thing actually that I should mention, which is that many customers started telling us, hey, here's what I've done in order to provide a better service to my patients. They, so they started to share use cases. They started to share things that they did in order to manage infection, uh, you know, infection mitigation. And uh, one of our first customers, Yale New Haven, was very, very fast to reach out to us and me and say, hey, I've used technology, yours, and a few other bits to find out where a COVID patient might have interacted with a set of providers so that I can understand what's the sphere of infection. And he said, it didn't cost anything. Um, I used technology I already had, I used one sign, provided one sign and a few other bits. And it says, you know, would you post this and share this with your other customers? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, as a provider, we're delighted to do that. We opened up a page on our website and we called it uh, very imaginatively the COVID page. Um, <laughs> and customers could go to this COVID page and pull these use cases with, with usable descriptions and technical descriptions on how to get this running. And of course, we would help them uh, as they needed help. Uh, so we now have nearly 20 of these use cases on our website. They are all uh, free of charge for customers to access. So these are really the two things that we did for customers right away as we knew customers were overwhelmed. Um, and that was the early phase. Now the customers are more in control of their environment and things are starting to uh, be in a, in, in, a, in a better understood cadence now they're reaching back to us and they're saying, hey, I need your help here, I need your help there. And for that, we are absolutely responding with our design engineers, with our sales engineers, and with our sales teams to say, okay, how, how do we help you? Let's make sure we do this right so that this isn't just a Band-Aid. Like, you know, one of the things sometimes you gotta do in a crisis is you gotta throw some Band-Aids on, fine. But once you start to clear the fog of war, you really should be doing things uh, with more of a strategy in mind. Um, even your band-aids have to fit into your strategy. Right. Uh, and, and this is how we're guiding customers now saying, let's observe your digital identity strategy. What is that? And let's do things that you need now that don't complicate your strategy down the road that actually support your digital identity strategy today and down the road. So that's the moment that we're in now, 60 days into this, uh, into this uh, pandemic. Right. How, how would you describe sort of the speed at which this unfolded? I was thinking about it this morning, depending on how you're thinking about it, you could say this happened really fast, or you could say it happened kind of slowly. I, I think it all depends on your perspective, but I've also heard other CIOs, uh, you're a CEO, but I've talked to a lot of CIOs, and they've talked about, it's a, it was a really good time to have had a good amount of experience. You know, you wouldn't want it to be the first six months of your first CIO gig. Uh, you've been around a while, you've had other CEO positions. Do you feel like, like, okay, I'm ready for, this is big, but I've, I've got enough experience that you mentioned, I've got a lot of less, lessons learned, and I see the speed at which this is evolving, and I see it coming, and there's some, you're like, you have some clarity, like I understand yeah. and I've got this. Did you feel like that or how did, how did it sort of evolve for you? Well, I think your, your foresight and certainly my foresight is, is gotten better, <laughs> you know, better with uh, over time and with events such as this. And I think, um, you know, when I looked at the year 2000 event, you know, and I look back at it and said, okay, uh, we did okay, but there's a bunch of things we could do better, that I could do better, that I could see 
more clearly into the future. When I saw that 2008, 2009, uh, we had, you know, as a company and myself had prepared better for that. For this particular one, this was a double whammy. Remember, 2000 was just the date. Uh, 2008 was just the economy, mm -hmm. uh, right? It was, uh, you, you know, the subprime markets. You know, this right. was a duel. This was a double hit. This was the pandemic followed by a, an oil crisis, followed by an economic crisis. So you can almost say it was a triple hit. Right. I kind of lump, you know, oil and economy sort of, you know, into one effect, although, you know, more accurately, someone could pull it apart. So this was very unusual. Not very many CEOs, I can't think of who, you know, would have experienced a double, you know, hit like this, uh, maybe in some other parts of the world where, you know, there are, you know, uh, uh, times of war, et cetera. But, right, right. But, but coming to this particular event, uh, I, I did feel that we had a seasoned executive team mm -hmm. that understood, hey, something real big here is starting to happen. And we didn't have the head in the sand syndrome. We, we didn't have the wistful thinking that, hey, we'll wait this out. You know, it'll be a couple of weeks and we'll be back to business. We knew this was big. Yeah. And um, we started to see it in February. Um, we started to see it elevate in early days of March, and we took early steps to close the office so as to limit infection. And early, you know, we took quick action to send our people to home and guide them so that they could be productive. Now, remember, mm -hmm. many of our people have kids and they yeah. have other people at home, and do they have a quiet space? Do they have an office? um that that they can that they can operate and you know can they do eight hours continuous time right you get all these complications that we understood pretty early and we work with our employees to make sure that we could support them because they didn't know how to handle this so uh, you know we definitely had um uh, you know i think we observed it and we understood it reasonably well uh, mm -hmm. early on um but i would tell you that we also had a kickoff in january and had this thing, you know, shown up, uh, you know, a month earlier, it could have been that our kickoff was such a major super spread event that no, you know, yeah. we just could have been on the unlucky side of the equation. We were just fortunate, I think, is the other thing I would tell you. So, yes, um, definitely tenure, definitely experiencing rough seas makes you a better sailor. Uh, who said that? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that's helped us. And ultimately, we've been in a better position to help our customers. You mentioned your seasoned executive team, and this is something I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. Um, you've been there about four years, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and you took over uh, from the founding CEO, correct, mm -hmm. Omar? Right? That's right. That's right. So what, what I found to be very interesting in your tenure is that you've retained almost all or quite a bit of your executive team. And a lot of times when someone comes in, uh, there's significant turnover. So I suspect, I've always suspected there's something about your leadership style that kept these people around. What do you think that is? It's, uh, uh, it, it, it is the focus um, and the, the focus on the customer is ultimately what it came down to. We all believed, and we did have a little bit of turnover, uh, and it was, you know, design necessary turnover at the executive mm -hmm. level. But it was, but the people that stayed were people that were really committed to two things: one, our customers, and two, the realization that we had to have a well-run business if we we're going to serve our customers well. Mm -hmm. We had to have what I call the sustainable business, a business that wasn't losing money, and at the time. The business was losing a lot of money when I came in three and a half, almost three, four years ago. Uh, in fact, we were so deep in the red that we needed to go find and borrow more money that no one would lend us. I didn't know any of this. It, 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 yeah. No one would lend us money at the yeah. time because we, we were doing some things really well. The product side was working really well, but the way the efficiency within the business, the way we spent our money, our customers' money, was really very, um, well, it was pretty poor, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> so, so, you know, and there was no reason why at that time we were in that state. Um, it, it was just that we, as a company, um, you know, uh, the, the prior team had no interest in, in that. That's the way that they had been running the business. And so, so 
as I came in, I said, one thing is customers always first. Our people need to understand that um, this is more than just building a product. This is helping healthcare. And that meant a lot personally to us. Mm -hmm. And those that felt that way stayed with the business and made sure the business could be self-sustaining. There was a third thing that, that was you know, lacking in some parts of the business, it was teamwork. And if we couldn't work together as executives and as teams right across the business, then we had a real issue. Um, so uh, yeah, so that that's really uh, what got us to where we are now. And I'm and I'm actually very grateful that we had the time to sort these things out with the business before COVID hit. Had COVID hit in 2016, as I came on board, uh, we would have had a lot more challenges. We didn't know yep. each other. We didn't know each other as people, as professionals. We didn't mm -hmm. trust each other. Uh, but we had time to clean, uh, sort out a number of these things. Um, uh, and, uh, and fortunately, we're here and we could move very quickly and very efficiently. Well, it's very interesting. Um, it's, it's almost like if we look at taking care of the customer as the fun, you know, it's almost like, listen, if we want to have fun, we have to get our house in order. We have to get our business in order. And that might not always be fun. So we have to do the work in order to play. Right? Is, it, is that a little bit? Exactly right. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. You, do, you know, some of it is hard work, right? It, yeah. It's, you know, but there is satisfaction in hard work. There is satisfaction in the accomplishment of something that's difficult. The easy stuff, I don't know who remembers the easy stuff. It's easy, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like, you know, so, uh, so we did a lot of hard work early on in 16 and 17, and we could actually see the team come together and 18 and 19 were terrific years. So was 17, by the way. Uh, and we really started to gel as a strong culture of, of confidence, of trust, of commitment, uh, all of that to the customer. Uh, and in fact, we've seen customer relationships elevate and we went from a niche company that just did this silly badge tap and go to now a digital identity strategic vendor um, with mobility, with identity governance, with so many more things that our customers need and are getting from us. So it's interesting. I've been thinking about this a lot. They talk about, uh, it's a poor term, but the, the winners and losers from a business point of view in COVID. You could be the, the most brilliant restaurateur in the world, right? You were running your business beautifully. You were playing and you were working. Your house was in order. Your business has probably been completely decimated. Sometimes the world moves away from you through no fault of your own, sometimes it moves towards you. Based on what's happened to healthcare organizations with extending through telehealth, remote employees, mm -hmm. all the things that have happened that healthcare organizations have to do, the world moved towards Improvada. People need you more than they did before. And because you said it was some fortuitous timing, the house is in order. So yeah. it's almost like, okay, we're sturdy enough to handle all this that's going to come our way. We deserve, not that we deserve it, but we've earned the right because we our house is in order and we're gonna do things the right way. So it's very, do you see it a little bit that way? We, we, we do, we do. We were fortunate enough to get our house in order, like you say, we're fortunate to fix the roof, fix the foundation, <laughs> fix the walls, right? You right. Know, put the right windows on so when it rains and pours sideways, right? You know, every which way, including sideways, that you know our, our ability to look after our customers was very much intact and when i say house i you know this is really about people right it's it's, it's not the physical entity of the business it truly is the people it's reorienting our people's attention to the house and and doing to the customer and doing the right things for the customer so we could sustain these rainstorms and these uh, you know intense uh, storms and I think you're exactly, you're, it's exactly right that at a time of crisis, customers run to the safest decision. They are less yeah. likely wow. to Good make point. high risk decisions. They're less likely to take a flyer. A, they don't have maybe the financial uh, sort of you know, security and comfort that they had under, under sunny days. Um, you know, it's pouring, it's bad. I mean, it's, it's rough and bad out there. So their decisions really have to matter and they're going to assume less risk. And as they do that, they look for partners that they can trust 
and they look for partners that are um, that are self-sustaining, that are stable, uh, yeah. and partners that they've shown um, that they can depend on. So yes, they are coming. You know, this actually is a very mutually beneficial relationship to both our customers, and ultimately they're helping us get to another level, higher level of servicing them. Yeah, but you, great point. And I think the term we, we're looking for is reputation, mm -hmm. right? If we've done the work, if we've treated people right, we have the reputation. If we have the reputation in times of crisis, the reputation makes the sale before anything. It's done. The right. sale is made. We know this company is trustworthy and they're going to do what they say they're going to do. They can deliver. That's we, right. They have the reputation. They've earned it. So that makes the sales done. If you work right, if you do things the right way, sales happen on their own in, in, right. in the, east, in the you know, out in space, right? That's, right? that's right. Sales becomes just a transaction. It's a, right. it's a reputation and the trust, right? Reputation is analogous to trust with our customers. And, uh, you know, we may not be able to solve all of our customers' problems, uh, but we'll be very honest with them about right. that. And we'll be very honest about what we can do very well. And, uh, and that's really what matters. And, uh, and our message to our customers is, look, um, this is our core strength and we're not gonna let you down. If you want something outside, we'll gladly send you to somebody else, some other vendor that we ourselves know and trust and we know can better service your needs. But if it's digital identity, um, we really think that we are it, and uh, yes, it's it's uh, it's you know it's it's a run to safety, right? It, this is right. where these relationships of confidence and trust uh, and reputation matter, and this is an industry that really, really you know depends on this. Uh, this is healthcare, and people's lives are at stake, so we take that very seriously. And we have to keep delivering, right? That's what you, as a CEO, tell the organization. If there's you know, there's, there's different kinds of stresses a business can have. One could be too little business. One could be too much business. When there's too much business, you know, hey, we have to deliver. We have to scale. We have to, no, nothing can fall through the cracks. No one can be let down just because we may have an influx. Like, that can't happen, right? That, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example where in late February, we saw COVID developing. And we have a number of, uh, for example, cloud services. You know, we're known both as an on-prem vendor with very strong, you know, capabilities, but also a, a cloud services vendor with, uh, for example, secure messaging, um, right? The remote access is a secure token service that's in the cloud. So as we started to ask the question, how do we give customers more access to our cloud technology? Um, we started to also ask the question, can we, can we serve twice as many customers? Can we serve twice the load of what we see today? So if customers are going to use more of our cortex, our secure messaging, um, and they're going to send more messages around, what, at what level do we believe we can service them with confidence without dropping a single message? Yep. And um, uh, so we started to test. Can we do twice the level of volume? Can we do three times? Can we do four times? And the bar was set at 4x. And we tested it and we found that now we can only do about a little over two. So Let's put the equipment and the technology in place where we can safely do Forex before we tell the customers they can use as much of it as they want. Right. So we took the steps to assess our capacity first, knowing that there's going to be a spike, understand what that capacity is, raise it up to a level we felt was, was safe and that we weren't going to miss a beat, drop yeah. a message. Right. And we did that all on our nickel, all on our dime before customers needed it. And I think that's just terrific work on our teams and our engineering and our DevOps teams because they worked around the clock and around weekends to do this. We did it literally in two days. Uh, and then we announced to our customers, hey, use more, as much Cortex as you want. And we saw the volume, frankly, spike. Um, so I could sit back as a CEO and say, okay, I think we've done this reasonably well. Uh, I, I, we were pleased with what we could do for our customers. Of course, we did this in many, many other areas. Just one example where we wanted to uh, test our systems and make sure that they would stand up under the onslaught of COVID. Right, right. Has COVID, you know, uh, the CEO's got to set the direction 
Um, so in January, you had a direction of products you were working on, things you were doing, uh, customer wish list, whatever you want to call it. Has COVID-19 changed your thoughts? Uh, you know, and this is sort of a chance to give a message to customers about here's what I'm thinking as CEO. Uh, here's where I'm thinking we're going to go a little bit left instead of straight because of the new world. Any thoughts there around the direction of Improvada, things you're going to be working on? Yeah, that, that's a terrific, terrific question. And COVID has impacted uh, our customers' thinking and our customers' needs from technology, especially the technology that we are involved in and many other areas. But certainly, so one of the things that COVID did very, very quickly is it pushed our customers to embrace a much broader network. They sent a lot of people to work from home. Um, they implemented telehealth uh, in, in ways that were very, very creative. And we observed all of that. Now, by the way, we were thinking that uh, before COVID that this was naturally going to happen, but over a period of, you know, maybe four, five, seven years. Well, COVID made this happen in two weeks. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, our, our customers are very creative, contrary to maybe some, you know, sort of, you know, uh, some, some, some belief that healthcare is stodgy. Healthcare is very creative and is very innovative. And I'm not just talking about the vendor community, I'm talking about the healthcare givers. What they will never compromise on, by the way, is the value and the healthcare delivery to the patient. Mm -hmm. So they will never compromise this, and most vendors don't understand this. Vendors who are not in healthcare do not understand that edict, that guiding principle of our providers. But back to you know what did COVID push? It pushed an expansion, a rapid expansion of networks beyond just the hospital, the well-known parts of the network, but you know, the hospitals, the acute care, the clinics, it, it, you know, now these hospital networks are embracing all of their employees' environments, their home environments, their remote environments. Um, and we very quickly shifted our energies to say, let's, let's make sure we scale, that our solutions can scale to these levels uh, of growth, number one. Uh, number two, um, cloud. You know, the ability to implement technologies with very light and zero touch uh, from an IT perspective became very, very important. Uh, simply because we had, our customers would do things so quickly and they didn't have all the right staff um, to in the right location to do all these implementations. So technologies have to be very light touch or zero touch on an implementation. Um, so that's a second, um, you know, key element that COVID, you know, not just accelerated, but really introduced, mm -hmm. um, you know, made, made real. We also saw customers adopt a lot more cloud because of this light zero touch uh, technology perspective. Uh, and it did so, you know, I, I felt very well. So, so yes, uh, you know, we saw our customers move very quickly in a number of areas. Uh, frankly, we thought that made terrific sense. Um, and we followed these trends and supported them. And what we did as products, we accelerated the uh, work that we did in mobility, uh, in iOS, in Android, with smartphones and tablets, in order to support the telehealth initiatives that our customers were investing in. We supported more uh, automation and, uh, uh, you know, and simplification of remote access um, with, uh, you know, two-factor authentication, automatic, invisible two-factor authentication. And we felt that other things could uh, could be delayed, uh, you know things like, uh, for example, you know digital patient identity, which probably is important, but in the heat of the battle, you're going to look to treat patients, and you may come around later to build up, um, you know things like uh, patient identity, so that you can understand exactly who you're dealing with. So there's some things that you focus on more on, things you focus on less on, and we definitely adjusted our priorities pretty significantly, um, especially in these areas of mobility, in these areas of cloud, and the areas of light and zero touch technology. So our customers should know that they can now implement our stuff completely virtually, very light zero touch. We don't need to send people on site. They don't need to send people on site. We can do things completely remote and with very light touch. Excellent. Well. I think uh, I've taken enough of your time today, Gus. Is there anything else you want to add before we get going? Any final thoughts? No, this is this. Uh, well, thank you. This has been terrific. Thank you for your time. This is frankly a time where we've all come together as an industry 
And uh, the principles of putting customers first and building the right relationships, I think allows us to work together in this fight, in this, you know, this war against COVID. And I will say that when I see that some of the legislation and some of the, some of the work that's happening in DC, uh, where the focus has been on a lot more of the physical uh, work on, for example, PPE, I think we stand to benefit by bringing technology into this COVID fight. So if there is an area where I would say we, we might have left one of our star players on the bench, you know, um, uh, metaphorically speaking, mm -hmm. I, I think that our, you know, legislators, uh, maybe parts of our government, um, our, you know, our directional guidance has been more oriented towards classical physical investments versus technology and digital investments. And, uh, you know, the, the, America, the U.S. is renowned for its technology, its strength in technical areas and innovation. And I really felt that we've left that star player on the bench. Now, Improvada didn't stay on the sidelines. We dove right into it. We didn't have to be asked. We didn't have to be told. Uh, we dove right in. But I think it's important to understand we have a great asset as a country, and we shouldn't be afraid to use it. In fact, I think we're going to be much better served as we pull it into the fight. Very good, Gus. Thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed this. Anthony, a pleasure. A pleasure as always.